Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and ghouls and ghoulettes. So, or should that be witches and ghouls or something? Yeah, whatever. Ghouls and ghoulies. Ghouls and ghoulies. So that's it. We're. <laughs> Damn it! I wrote it. Well, uh, well. Okay, hold on. All right. Welcome to a very pleasant um, nighttime discussion for of the. Damn it! Hold on. Okay, breathe. A, listen and breathe, Raph. Breathe. Roger Ebert needed 15 takes. It's okay. <laughs> Damn it, Gene. Gene was always playing footsie. Okay. You can do it. Here we go. <laughs> Don't put that image in my head. Okay, so welcome to a podcast discussion uh, surrounded... Welcome to a podcast... You gave cop and a half <laughs> thumbs up, Raph. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize now, sir. Uh, no, I won't do that. What? No, no, no. I won't do that. I, uh, oh, listen, I, I saw things in Cop and a Half. Yeah, that, I admired. that no one else did. Okay, well. It's I funny. watched that film just because of the Siskel and Ebert review. Oh, <laughs> really? It does be like that sometimes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I knew it even existed until I saw that review. Like, okay, now I actually got to watch this. <laughs> yeah, Leonard yeah. Part 6, North, it, uh, it all comes yeah. back mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So let's not talk about Leonard. We're here to talk about a, an arguably better movie. So mm-hmm. um, with less offenders, uh, 1964's Quiet Ant. <laughs> Okay, let me. <laughs> <laughs> is who is that? There's a phone in the background. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> with me. Well, actually, better yet, gentlemen, how about you introduce yourselves? Let's start with uh, our good friend, Patrick. Patrick, what do you have to say for yourself? Uh, I'm Patrick Galvin. I am a a film journalist who has written for places like sci-fi.com, toekingdom.com, artculturemag.com, offscreen.com, one of the uh, co-organizers for the online uh, convention, Kaiju Masterclass, and the author of the uh, recently published book, uh, Ruan Ling Yu, Her Life and Career, which is available on amazon.com. All right, and uh, Mr. Brayton, what do you have to say about yourself? I'm here too, and I have a 12 pound pumpkin on my head mm-hmm. because Halloween's coming. Exactly. And, uh, well, what makes the situation problematic is my head alone encompasses like over half of my entire body weight. So with the extra force, I may totally collapse in on myself. That was so our. So you kind of like uh, the the Elephant Man. You like uh, have to. I'm not a jack o' lantern. I am a. <laughs> A, a gort. I don't know. A squash. <laughs> you, you, you say that while you're being chased by a mob in a Spirits Halloween store. <laughs> I will do that. Yes. I will record it for you and send it to David Lynch and <laughs> he'll say, what the hell is that? All right. But no, gentlemen, we are here to discuss about a movie we all generally love and one that, like a lot of movies I have not revisited in a long while, I think I've come to reappraise it immensely upon giving it a very fresh watch. 1964's Kaidan. The film is based on stories written by uh, a Greek guy who lived in Japan the later mm-hmm. part of his years named uh, Lafcadio O'Hearn. And through his, uh, his stories that he collected, he was trying to preserve this notion of Japan as it was pre-Westernization, because at this point in history, Japan is forced out of its isolationist period about 40 years before he came there. It's rapidly Westernized, because now you, now you have Western technology, clothing, mm-hmm. hairstyles, you know. So Lafcadio O'Hearn was kind of frustrated that this country, which, which seems so exotic and whatnot, is all of a sudden becoming more like other parts of the world. Through his stories, he was trying to like you know preserve his ideal version of Japan, so to speak. His story is a little similar to that of the Brothers Grimm's in the sense that he found all these lesser known folk tales and gathered them all to be archived for future generations. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm I'm kind of glad this unique gentleman existed. <laughs> Okay, as we know, the 1960s was kind of a golden era, not just for Japanese science fiction and fantasy films, but maybe I would argue fantasy films in general, or fantastic cinema. And Kaidan is definitely a part of that wide decade. However, this one's unique because it is a horror anthology, and although there was a lot of horror anthologies, this one kind of takes a slightly different uh, route. It's sort of a more calm and pleasant take on what Mario Bava was doing around the same decade. Mario Bava was doing a lot of horror anthologies like, um, oh, not, not Black Sunday. Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath and uh, Twice Told Tales. They have a similar feel to Kaidan in the sense that they're more colorful and almost classical in their setup. 
but Kaidan takes it in a much more romantic, almost melancholy way that I'll, ex- I'll go into detail later. But one of the notes I wrote, and this is something maybe Patrick can illuminate us on, this doesn't feel like a typical Toho fantasy tokusatsu film. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's important to talk about like the background of the film. Um, it's not mm-hmm. really a, uh, a Toho production per se. Mm. Um, this film was produced by a uh, now extinct production company called Ninjin Club, directed by uh, Kobayashi Masaki, who was before this point a director at Shochiku. Kobayashi was a, a very interesting uh, anti-establishment kind of director. His films almost consistently have themes of like, you know, individuals against groups or against society, against social trends. And he was always, you know, butting heads with Kitoshiro on top of also like the expenditures that he would usually rack up with his films because he was a perfectionist in the literal sense of the word. Toho agreed to finance about like 100 million yen for the thing, but they were only going to give Kobayashi about 30 million at a time. And so they gave him the first 30 million. And at that point, Shochiku decided to back out the whole thing and they wanted their investment back. So the money that Toho gave the filmmakers had them go to Shochiku to pay back what they owed them for their investment because they'd already spent it on, you know, getting ready for the thing. And so the film was throughout its long production. It was like, I think it was about a year in production, which is gigantic, especially for a Japanese film. They were constantly running out of money. Um, At one point, Kobayashi had to sell his house to help finance it. His mentor, Keisuke Kinoshita, loaned him like 50 million or so yen to help keep it afloat. Uh, There were all kinds of things that were going on. It was not shot in a traditional film studio because there were no film studios that were big enough. And he uh, initially thought of shooting it out in exteriors and location filming. But uh, Kobayashi, after the success of his previous film, Harakiri, which was uh, plotted internationally for its great stylized filmmaking, wanted to go even further with the stylization, especially since he was going to be shooting this in color. This was going to be, this was his first color film. And he found that, you know, shooting outdoors where the light changes every 10 minutes or so Mm -hmm. wasn't going to work that way. And especially, you know, locations change, you know, weather changes. So he realized he had to shoot it indoors. And there were no film studios at Toho, Shochiku, wherever, that were big enough to support the sheer size that he wanted to go for. So he and his uh, crew were in a helicopter flying over Kyoto, and they found this uh, large, what used to be a military aircraft hangar, which is funny because Kobayashi was so anti-military. Um, so it, it was a former military hangar converted to a storage center for Nissan vehicles storing like their auto bodies and whatnot. They rented that, and they had to uh, paint the huge cycloramas for for every single scene. Every time there was a new scene, the cyclorama had to be repainted and whatnot. The sets had to be changed and so on and so forth. There had to be scaffolding, so the lights would not be visible in the shot, given how Kobayashi's like, you know, wide shots he wanted to go for. And because the lights were so high, the lights had to be extra strong to reach down at the bottom of the set, which meant the lighting was very expensive as well. All those things combined with Kobayashi's perfectionism meant that it was a long, long shoot. And Kobayashi um, was interviewed by a woman named Adi Bach, who uh, used to be pretty active running by Japanese cinema. She's now involved in like, politics, I think. Uh-oh. But, um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, she um, wrote her dissertation about Japanese film directors in the 70s, and so she interviewed Kobayashi for that. And Kobayashi told her that on an average day shooting Kwaidan, they would only get maybe three successful takes in a day. All those what? reasons combined led to a very long production schedule and the film being very, very expensive. At least Kurosawa was notoriously thrifty and always under schedule, so Toho didn't have to worry about that. No. <laughs> no, so there's a good chance this movie came close to not even being finished, because from what you're telling me, it sounds almost like a an Orson Welles level epic that barely could keep together. Toho um, actually took out insurance on the film's negatives just to cover their asses in case wow. something happened. And they actually sent a quote unquote watchdog, somebody from their studio to like, you know, keep watch on production to make sure things were actually- That was the eye. Uh... Yeah. That was the eye in the sky. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, so, the, that's the significance of the eyes. Biggest takeaway I think a lot of people have, and I certainly have, are the visuals. And it is interesting mm-hmm. and remarkable how this was his first color film. He's one of my newfound favorite directors. Obviously, I haven't seen a bunch from Kobayashi. I've seen The Human Condition and like Harakiri and Samurai mm-hmm. Rebellion. But those films are so rich in their black and white cinematography, and what, he creates such beautiful images in the frame. And it's funny, his first color film, how much color do you want in all of the color? It's a wonderful watercolor world he's created. Yeah. And, well, you know, and Kobayashi, um, you know, before he became a filmmaker, he was um, studying to be an art historian. I should say, like, his mentor was a student of Lafcadio Hearn. Oh, uh, wow. 
So there's a, there's a lot of connective tissue going on here. But yeah, Kobayashi loved Oriental art. And from a young age, he wanted to be a film director. But once he got into uh, Waseda University, he became more interested in arts. And the reason why he went back to films was because World War II was coming out. Mm. And Kobayashi felt like, you know, it could take me decades, maybe a lifetime, to leave an important mark on the world of art history. And with the war coming up, I'm probably going to be drafted and I may not even live to do that. So with movies, though, I can probably have a better chance of actually leaving an impression, something that will actually last. And unfortunately for him, uh, even though he then joined Shochiku, um, was, he was shortly thereafter drafted and then sent over to China and didn't get to direct a movie until he came back years later. But um, anyhow, back to what, what I was getting at is that you know, he uh, studied um, Oriental art, was you know, very much enamored with it and knew it very, very, very well. So that definitely plays a factor, I would say, into how this movie looks. I mean, of course, he was also like very open to. Um, he wasn't controlling in the sense of like with the like the art staff. Like he would let the art staff bring their ideas and do their work, and he would just like come in, like make corrections and adjustments. But you know, he knew his stuff very, very well when it came to arts and the visual look of things, yeah. which definitely I'd say plays a big factor not only to this film but all his movies. His movies are all very, very beautiful to look at. At least oh, all yeah. the ones I've seen. I know one of the notes I took when I was rewatching the movie, um, and I'm just going to say it straight, the art direction is like a universe within a stage play and vice versa. In fact, when we get to real world locations in uh, Hoichi the Earless, it feels almost like a betrayal or cop out. Thankfully, it still works in the end. But yeah, now that you mentioned that, it makes so much sense because this is one of those rare movies that perfectly captures a painting in a physical live action sense. Yeah, it and, relishes in the artificiality. Yes, so. yeah. And it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah it, it works beautifully because we know it's on sets, we know it's artificial, but you still buy into this living painted world, so to speak, and it works out yeah. beautifully for the most part. I hadn't really thought of what you just mentioned about like you know, the few times where they do do uh, some out some outdoor shooting. Like they also do some stuff in like the first episode where the guy is like on the horseback shooting targets. That was shot yeah. outdoors, and some of the in the forest stuff as well. You're, you're right, you know, when whatever it is outdoors, it almost feels kind of like you know. It doesn't quite fit in a certain way. Like it yeah, just it's a little jarring. It's definitely very jarring. I hadn't really thought of that until you mentioned it, but I absolutely 100 percent agree with you. It's it's still a very good film stock and cinematography yeah. they're using, so it's not too yeah. much of a horrific stretch. As opposed to, I've seen movies where it's almost completely in studio, and then the minute they go outside, it, the grain gets bad, and clearly mm -hmm. they got the second unit's uh, cousin-in-law to come in and film it. So I'm glad the movie came out as beautiful as it did. But yeah, if he didn't do this semi-independently i think the movie would probably come out looking a lot different so i'd, I'd be terrified to imagine the alternate world where we get kaidan from shochiku <laughs> kidoshiro was a very uh money conscious producer mm -hmm. so i don't yeah I don't, I don't think he would have uh approved of this film yeah we would have gotten one puppet skeleton in front of him <laughs> and that would have been it <laughs> Okay, so what's your personal introductions to this movie? Personally for me, and I'll try to keep this as short as possible, I had this book, I forgot what the title of it is, but I know it was like a big book of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror movie reviews. I scanned the thing to find any interesting movie I could find, and there was a Kaidan, and I've never seen it before. And the only real Japanese horror movie I saw beforehand, not counting like maybe the H-Man, was Onibaba. So I rented it from uh, the local library. It was presented widescreen, so I didn't get any cropping or anything. After seeing the movie, I read up on it on other reviews and other movie websites of the day of the early internet. And unfortunately, American audiences and reviewers seem to misinterpret the film as something more cynical and mean-spirited, which I don't know if it might be like a cultural disconnect between our country and foreign media in general. I remember heavily there was a lot of um, misrepresentation of the film and especially the ending to The Woman in the Snow. People saw that more as like a cynical gag than the actual bittersweet tragedy actually is. I'm not as big or not as experienced with classic Japanese cinema or the greats of Japanese cinema as you two are, but I came to this movie just as a lover of uh, fantasy filmmaking and storytelling, and I adore this movie a lot. It's not exactly one I revisit constantly, but when I do, it's almost, it always grips me. I first saw this on the, I think the last week they were before they folded on uh, the old Filmstruck before they eventually oh. got uh, picked up Rest by Criterion peace. Channel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was trying to watch a bunch of stuff on there while I had the free trial. So like all within a week I was cramming. Uh, I watched uh, the two um, Kira Takarada uh, sort of James Bond riff movies. Yes. Uh, 
Yes, which Patrick recommended and which were loads of fun. And I watched this movie and it stuck with me. Prior to that, I had seen screen grabs online and just visually it was so arresting. And then a few years later during COVID actually in lockdown, I uh, re-upped my Criterion channel subscription and tried again to watch as much as I could. And I rewatched it. For me anyway, and this time around, it works and it's not a length issue, but I like watching it best in segments because especially since there's no wraparound or, you know, something that holds all the stories together in a narrative sense. I think it's one of those movies that you can watch in sequences and still get as much out of. And in the case of an anthology film, you know, nothing feels too rushed to me, even though the two middle segments feel like they had the most uh, attention paid to them, I will say. You know, it's funny now that you I'm just going to briefly say this. This is a movie where I know it's almost three hours, but it well, it's not really a full three hours, is it? It's it's a little more than three hours. It's like three hours and two minutes, I think. Yeah, and and yet it moves at a pretty brisk pace. You don't even notice that. I don't know if it is because of the anthology uh, format yeah. or it's just you know that well done of a movie. So even the weaker segment at the end still holds up in its own right. So, well, we'll get to that soon, but. Yeah. Patrick. We'll get to it. Yes. <laughs> it's not my cup of tea. Hey! <laughs> Here's the rubber star for the pun. Take it. Yeah, an opinion and a pun at the same time. Yes, exactly. My so. opinion. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so Patrick, what's your experience with this film? The first time I saw the film was through the uh, old Criterion release, which had, and we should, we should probably mention this really quickly, there have been throughout history multiple versions of this film. Uh, when Kobayashi took the film to Khan in 1964, the Khan Film Festival had, at the time, a limit of two hours that they would screen a film for. Kobayashi cut his definitive version from three hours and eight minutes, or whatever it is, down to 161, hoping that would be a good compromise that, that he could then negotiate permission to show that version at the Cannes Film Festival. But the festival was very uh, rigorous in its rules and said, no, it's gotta be two hours or we don't run the thing. So Kobayashi then cut out, which I think is what a lot of people's favorite sequence, which is the woman in the snow sequence, and then shortened the remaining three parts to bring it down to like an hour and 25 minutes, I think it was. And that 161 minute version that he made as a compromise is what sort of survived and circulated and was shown in art houses and whatnot. After Kobayashi's death, the original version was restored and in like 2016 or so was uh, released by Criterion. So the film was released by Criterion, this time in the full complete version. So I saw it that way as well. I think like anybody who really gets into Japanese cinema, eventually you come to Kobayashi's work. Uh, you mean, of course, you start off with like you know the big famous people like Kurosawa and Ozu and Mizuguchi. But when you become really curious, you start looking into the more obscure masters like Naruse and whatnot. And so Kobayashi is one of those figures you just inevitably learn about. Like this guy who made relatively not so many movies, but you know is regarded as one of Japan's great masters. So inevitably, I think you come around to watching his works. So that's so that's basically where quite on a ride for me. And uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a film that I've been awestruck by since I first saw it. It's just it's just so visually overwhelming. It, it's hard for me to really verbalize it, but it really just you know it, it's just a, a film that I find very overwhelmingly beautiful. Although I do I do kind of agree with Brayton in a sense that uh, in some ways I almost kind of like watching this film uh, out of sequence at points because I like parts I like certain stories more than I like others. Are we all in agreement that the final episode is the weakest of the four? Yes, I think. Why like, don't you cut that one? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, well, yeah that's what that's what I was thinking. Like, if you're, yeah, this it, must it, have been like a whole new movie when they like people rediscovered it when they put the story back in. So, yeah, because the woman in the snow sequence is, is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. it's probably yeah, it's probably like not the most iconic, but it's pretty up there. So it's like yeah, and I watched it because it's my favorite uh, segment, and I actually watched yesterday. Uh, Daye's version of Woman in the Snow, which oh, good. it's it's not it's not at the same level, but I, I think it's pretty darn good. It's a very unsettling story, but lopping that part of the movie out really would do a detriment to it. Yeah, that that's like playing the Twilight Zone and not showing any of the major classic episodes. Like, yeah. I the beholder, yeah. put that crap on the back burner. Bye. <laughs> Hey, well, aren't, doesn't Khan encourage you to make movies long as long as possible these days? Doesn't it totally flip? <laughs> it's pure atmosphere as far as its uh, visuals and execution goes. And with that says, do you think this movie 
is more true the tradition of old gothic horror films like a lot of the silent german expressionism films than most horror that's ever come after the 40s it almost seems to me like a film that's more of like a uh, artistic expression than most anything else like I, i'm not an expert on like japanese like you know classical art i i, I do i do recommend people um uh, see it i, rec- I encourage people to seek it out but uh i'm not really sure i can how i can word this people probably aren't used to seeing this kind of a film so much these days, if that makes any sense. Yeah, the subject matter has been done before and done since, but the way it's executed is just perfect and unique for this experience alone. Now we can kind of go a little bit into spoilers and just talk about you know the particular Holy crap there are ghosts in this movie <laughs> oh my god <gasps> Ooh, a quarter <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so i think the lesser of the better stories though is the black hair the first one but it is a really yeah. good opening to the whole story and it's fun and, and significantly shorter yes it's significantly too. shorter which i think is a good thing that yeah. it doesn't feel drug mm-hmm. out yes yes but no it's a good opener and it kind of calmly eases you into the world of the supernatural because at first you can see it as sort of a domestic drama with a bit of a kind of um, a sadly comical edge. You know, this mm. this man who's so sick and tired of living in poverty leaves his wife to marry basically a snotty, high-nosed mm. royal. Pure, not out of love or anything, purely to uh, yeah. Yeah, raise up in the social status. Exactly. Yeah. Very I, rash I, I, I've a word that rhymes with witch and starts with a B. Mm-hmm. Is that what, you're thinking of? what was that? The, nothing, nothing. The, 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 snow, the snow bitch is what you're saying. <laughs> Oh God, that's the Asylum remake of A Woman in the Snow. So the yeah, the um, the snow bitch actually was my nickname for Sarah Palin for the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> that's changed with her falling in the social status. Right, her giant eyeball looking at it uncompleted highway. <laughs> so, yeah. It is interesting that the first two episodes are, are really about like you know these uh, female ghosts who are who feel betrayed by the men that they love. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But it's like rewatching the film, the dialogue sequence they have when him and his wife are reunited is truly sad she says it's wonderful to see you again even for a brief moment yeah. and to him it's like don't say that we'll be together for nine lifetimes or for her you get you know it's pretty clear she knows she's dead or she knows there's you know she's n- she's not along with this world but at least they had a brief moment of reconnection yeah. and it really is more of a of a tragic story than a sort of gotcha revenge tale that you see in a lot of horror tales like again the movie eases you into the supernatural at first you just imagine it's just a period drama with a little bit of style to it before the poor guy realized oh my god i slept with a ghost <laughs> I feel for him a little bit. Maybe yeah. not. His negligence maybe wasn't worthy of intergalactic Rod Serling-esque comeuppance <laughs> at the end. But, but it, yeah, still, he does, you know, it's it's good to see that he at least had a, had an arc of showing grief and returning oh, to Oh, yeah, it. because you do, you when he, like, what he says to his wife when he returns, you do see that he is honestly sorry about what he's done. Yeah, and realizes that he acted in selfishness. Yeah, mm-hmm. but sadly, it still ends up being an incredible tragedy at the end. And, yeah, yeah I do agree. It does get a little, like, Rod sort of like, I'm, I don't feel good about the sponsors this week. I'm going to make this This guy's more. a bastard. Now time to pay at my hand. <laughs> and then his hair falls out. Exactly. Uh, so, but, yeah. Really disturbing effects work at the Oh just, yeah, yeah. Like that's mm-hmm. maybe that's maybe the most sho- like viscerally shocking moment. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, is when yeah you see what's become of his wife and then the transformation that he goes through. Oh yeah, it's a great transformation too. Like it reminded me of uh, the Howling Man from the Twilight Zone, where the guy walks behind a bunch of pillars <laughs> and he slowly transforms. But this oh, one, well, is... that, well, that's kind of the old uh, Werewolf of London transformation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the Werewolf of London. But this was done way better because it's both yeah. subtle, but like you said, visceral in its uh, presentation, I should say. And, and, yeah. you got, and you also realize that you're, as you're watching, that's another reason why this film took so long to make because sometimes they they change appearance between shots. So mm. Yeah. You know, more time that the makeup department has to like you know get to work to. Uh, before they even start shooting the next shot yeah that, that also applies to the next sequence as well so yeah and it, it is good makeup too it's like i forgot mm-hmm. how strong the makeup looked even on like an hd screen so oddly enough the idea of a man returning to his wife after many years and finding out she had already passed it's been done in japanese fiction before you famously is basically yeah. just an extension of this story and i don't know if you is directly based on the original tale that the black hair is based on but ironically the same story was kind of redone or readapted 
into a fantasy anime I saw in the 90s called Windaria, which is about a tragic war between two kingdoms in a fantasy setting. And it's a bunch of different subplots that ultimately combine together into one final ending. But yeah, there is a story where... I'm, I'm just happy you didn't say it was adapted into Gahara the Long-Haired Monster. That's... <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, creepy hair is a, a common thing you see in a lot of like Japanese fiction. But yeah, when Daria, one of its lead heroes, returns to his wife after the war is over, or just as the war is about to end, and he realizes, you know, even though he's reunited with this wonderful woman, sadly she ended up being one of the victims of the war, and, you know, it has a similar ending. Granted, he makes out okay and helps rebuild the world, but, you know, there's no scary, spooky hair things going on. But yeah, it's interesting that, I don't want to say it is a famous story, but it seems to be like a recurring trope in classic mm -hmm. Japanese uh, ghost stories. As cool as the black hair is, though, I think the most memorable of all the stories is Woman of the Snow, which is the second mm -hmm. tale. Yes. And I think this story is so... For one thing, it's very unique in this whole anthology because it isn't really a ghost story. It's a yokai story. Even knowing there's a lot of yokai that are technically ghosts in a more monstrous form than what we're accustomed to. Yokai, to me, I think the best way to describe them is they have more in common with European fairies than they do with uh, just pure horror monsters or ghosts. Yeah, like, I was kind of getting there's a uh, the Snow Queen vibes a little from yeah. there's, there's there's an old Soviet Soviet fairy tale Hans Christian Andersen. There's a there's been multiple adaptations of it, multiple film versions of it. Yeah, and uh, Yuki Anna or just simply Snow Woman uh, is a, one of the most famous of all yokai. So much so that mm -hmm. more so than Kappas or Onis or even especially Tingu. Surprisingly, there's been more Japanese fiction surrounding Snow mm -hmm. Women than there have been you know of the other arguably more famous monsters i wrote in my notes and i do want to read this uh the yuku ono or snow woman being its own unique species of fictional monster often gets simplified into a mere vampire or ghost by western audiences the woman of the snows is a famous enough story that there's been a lone film adaptation outside kaidan and of course there's been numerous yokai adjacent super sentai shows with snow women villains with that says though do you think this movie and this segment alone kind of made the snow woman like way more more popular in Japanese fiction than ever because I don't think there was really much in the way of snow women media beforehand. Yeah, I don't know of anything pre this. Like yeah. I mentioned before, I did watch the uh, Dae's version of which I will reiterate is really not as good, but is worth watching mm -hmm. and very visually arresting in its own right. Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, the Yuki Ona's popularity throughout history, but mm -hmm. uh, you know it, does, it did come from Hearn's collection. You know, I, I believe Hearn got the story from a farmer in Japan, and so it was like a like a folk tale that he heard that was passed along through the generation. So, um, I yeah, I, it's a good question. I'm not I'm not too familiar with the ebb and flow of the, of the uh, of this yokai's popularity throughout history, but I think it might be fair to say this did help make it more accessible, perhaps for yeah. people you know since the, the 1960s. Yeah, because it's weird. This movie is usually cited by like a lot of fantasy authors around the world whenever they decide to throw in a, a snow woman into their works. Uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes horrifically. Like, uh, there's a lot of horrible modern day Buffy the Vampire Slayer ripoffs where they throw mm -hmm. in a Yuki on a. And again, they simplify it as like, oh, she's a scary demon or she's a vampire, when in reality, they're their own group of creatures, like, you know, like the harpy in Greek mythology. It's it's interesting watching this. It's definitely the, the most memorable of the four stories. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best because uh, we're, we're about to get into the earless boy in a moment. That's a, that's a good contender. Who'd win a battle? The earless boy or the snow woman? N neither. <laughs> they're, they're technically mm -hmm. nice. Getting back to what i was saying earlier a lot of people again like the black hair it's usually misinterpreted as a much more cynical and nastier story than it actually is and famously yeah. uh -huh. uh, woman of the snow was both the original story by Hearn and even the film version here was famously ripped off or reimagined if you will and uncredited in the tales of the dark side movie except they replaced the snow woman with a gargoyle in modern day uh, new york oh. yeah so and that movie definitely takes a much darker ending uh whereas in in this one and this, I, and this one it's just sad yeah <laughs> that's the thing I remember reading reviews as a kid. People assume the ending of this one is cynical because, yeah, she reveals herself to be a yokai. She leaves. And then it's I remember some American reviewers cynically saying, oh, yeah, and then he throws the shoes out for her. So but no, that's not him throwing the shoes out. That was him 
mourn, mournfully and and sadly and lovingly still giving her the shoes and of course the fact that the shoes disappear soon yeah. after that really hits you in the in the heart right there mm -hmm. oh my god they still love each other but the yeah, man, and then the, he ha and then he has a breakdown all by himself, yeah, and the spotlight shines down on his mourning or loss. Exactly. So yeah, it really it, they were uh, so wonderful together. They had a a really big family of three kids. There was a lot of yeah. there was a lot of yokai human love and going on there. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing in the die the, the the spoiler alert, I guess. The ending <laughs> of the die movie plays out very similarly. But yeah, one of the one of their children has a comeback Shane type moment as the snow when he goes into the oh, distance. So yeah, oh, there's. My god that's even sadder <laughs> yeah no it's not gruesome or anything by any mm -hmm. stretch of the man well she i mean she does kill his buddy but you know other than that <laughs> to, to be fair she's probably, a, she needed he blood. probably deserved to die yeah <laughs> yes he deserved to die and i hope he burns in hell how do you like that <laughs> or freeze in hell in this case yeah <laughs> he's not important to the story it's a much more of a drama like a full-fledged drama of a supernatural story and then a love story and then an oh my god reveal and the acting by Nakadai Tatsu and, and uh, Kishi Keiko is like, you no, know, it just couldn't be any better. Such wonderful chemistry for this bit, too. And Kobayashi did use these two quite frequently throughout his uh, career. Um, mm -hmm. And But his use of uh, Kishi Keiko, who plays the Yuki Ona, is particularly interesting because she rose to fame about 10 years before this in a trilogy called What Is Your Name, which was a very mawkish, sentimental, uh, romantic epic. And when she played the uh, stereotypical, like, you know, weak girl in love who's too meek and shy to shape her own destiny. But Kobayashi definitely spun that image around when he used her because he routinely cast her in these in these much more vicious in command kind of roles. Actually, there's a if I would recommend a, another film that he made that she's in, a film called The Inheritance about a patriarch who's dying of cancer, trying to do a lot of his inheritance amongst his children and whatnot. And she plays his secretary who becomes his mistress. And she kind of like, you know, starts off as like this outsider in the story. And then she's kind of like, you know, working the narrative to her own advantage and kind of using him as the story goes along. And she's great in it. And Kobayashi loved to use her in these kind of roles. So um, it's just fascinating looking at her, the trajectory of her career, how she goes from playing, what is her name, made her famous. Then making films like this, where she's just, where she's like, you know, sub, where she's basically in command, in control has total power over the men around her. It's it's very fascinating in that sense. And yeah, she's great. Nakadai is great as he always is. The acting could not be better in this episode, in my opinion. Exactly. And I think calling it a tragic romance would be a better way to describe this one. Because yeah, there mm -hmm. is the scary element. It's like, oh my God, the old sir old man dead in this movie has just been killed by a by a vampire. And you, girl. you're young and handsome and virile, so yeah. I shall spare you. <laughs> yeah, and, and oh God, that's another thing. This is a movie where you discover something new when you rewatch it a second or third time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. yeah, according to her, the way her dialogue goes, it's obvious that this uh, Yuki Ana lady has been kind of uh, stalking our our hero Minokichi the whole mm -hmm. time. Like she's aware that he's a local. She likes mm -hmm. him. She fancies him. She was like, you definitely get the feeling that she's been, you know, kind of watching him from a distance, even when she isn't on screen. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she chose this person to be her husband in the human world it really is extremely romantic and again just adds and a believable romance too yeah you know? it's, it, it's not just she was playing him the, for the long game and then pulled an aha fooled you at the end like, <laughs> take that they, human ha yeah there, there's an element they really had it there was an affection there yeah mm -hmm. exactly and an affection that remained even after the it's not really betrayal it's like again he just it was from so long ago he didn't even think about it twice he was with a mm -hmm. woman he loved yeah true it was foolish you don't you know destroy the magic spell just like that but in a moment of yeah, carelessness carelessness yeah. thank you that you know this wonderful relationship and the magic spell that was kind of keeping it together broke apart but even then even and she was giving him vibes i mean she turned blue for god's sake <laughs> <laughs> it's like to, to be fair though maybe she should have like you know uh, hubby don't tell me if there's a magical yokai evolve it's not gonna end well <laughs> But yeah, this story definitely is awesome, and I can see why it's kind of made an impression with almost everyone who's seen it. I really do enjoy this story, and I am a sucker for fantasy-based romance, so I think that's the reason why it kind of appeals to me so much. Last, do they all, do they all run like that? <laughs> all the Yukianas you've seen, she's got a she's got a great run. Yeah, to be fair, I think she's the only one who I've ever seen run in these films. Usually they just. <laughs> They, really fast. Yeah, they, they either just float away majestically or they just, you know, teleport and all that. But yeah, this is the only one who like runs really fast when she's found out almost 
a little comically so. It was like, help me, China. I, I need to get out of here. Quick. <laughs> I told you this wouldn't Don't work. Don't fail me now. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, yeah, I, I do love the 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 giant all-seeing floating eyes. Are mm -hmm. real again a really cool uh, artistic touch. Kind yeah. of a yeah, kind of a Salvador Dali spellbound esque. Yeah, and I with love the giant floating surreal eyes. Yes, and I love how the giant the giant surreal floating eyes are kept ambiguous. Like, what the heck are what these the hell things? is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, it's like is it just a, a just a visual style uh, decision on the filmmakers, or is there something? like a greater supernatural force that's watching this unfortunate story uh, unfold. You definitely out. see images of, of uh, these eyes uh, throughout Japanese film history. Like there's a, a Kurosawa's Rhapsody in August, for example. I haven't seen the film in a while, but I believe it's a sequence where a Nagasaki survivor is looking at the sky and thinking about, about mm -hmm. the bombing of Nagasaki. And she sees like this giant eyeball kind of like you know, open up in the sky before her. Hmm. Uh, I, could, I could be misremembering the context of how, of how what led into the scene, but there is a, what stay with me, since I've seen that film, is the, the eye opening in the sky. And I, I have not seen the film, so I could be wrong about this as well, but uh, Kobayashi before this film, before this, made a film where there was a similar image in the movie, where hmm. there's a giant eye looking upon the protagonist. I've not seen that film, so I can't comment for sure but it's, de it's definitely something that he appears to have been interested in you definitely see also throughout japanese film history again also with the the kura south i mentioned yeah you know it could be something similar like how here in the west like movies will artistically show a face in the moon not exactly symbolism but just kind of a neat little commonplace visual i think would be a better way to describe it so maybe it's something similar with the eyes here like that uh, like that uh the uh, pizza time moon from that one commercial like, from 10 years ago <laughs> <laughs> sure patrick we'll go with that <laughs> There, and then there's the moon. There's the moon from Bear in the Big Blue House. There's that moon. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought of that show in 20 years. Oh yeah, the mic. The... Good night. Do, 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 do. Replace the man in this story with the bear from Bear in the Big Blue House, and it's twice as tragic. Because <laughs> then you got the whole interspecies thing tied into it. I'm or sorry. is it? Because she's a ghost, and it's weird. Uh -huh. and... I'm sorry, yeah, I broke yeah, the spell, like a... dear. Yeah, there was, a, there was a talking, singing shadow in Bear in the Big Blue House. So uh... <laughs> anything goes. There, there you go. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the horror theme. There you go. Now, without all that says, do you think the story is genuinely? romantic yeah I mean, that, that yeah, final that scene, final scene yeah. where um they're in the house their kids are asleep and mm -hmm. before he figures out before he is reminded of the yuki ona looking at her you just see them like you know he's making uh making uh sandals for her and they're just like you know quietly conversing like an actual married couple it's it, you definitely do get a lot of chemistry between them in that scene especially that's why again you have those very mixed feelings at the end at the end of the episode where you know he unintentionally you know breaks a vow that a, a vow that she kind of forced upon him he didn't actually promise yeah. anything mm -hmm. which is yeah. funny. He, he's he's no scumbag like the first guy you yeah. know <laughs> he didn't promise anything she, she just she just threatened him if you say anything i'll kill you so mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah then that happens and then she and then uh, you know she says okay i'm not going to kill you because we have our kids and you gotta look after them now but don't you dare do anything that you Thing to offend them or whatnot or i'll come back and then she leaves and he leaves the sandals for her in the snow and they disappear so she accepts them so mm -hmm. it's it definitely is shocking it's very visceral but it's also very emotional at the same time as beautiful as this story is both literally and figuratively visually and emotionally this is now that you guys mention it i can only imagine what happened off camera like after she threatened him she like ran off into the sky and it's like oh i got to talk to him yay <laughs> I've waited so long for this, and I killed and I ate an old man in turn. Yay! <laughs> yeah, doesn't she run into the eye? Isn't a yeah? It seems I that way. I, I guess that's the yokai equivalent of uh, Uber. I guess. <laughs> I guess. But with that said, speaking of samurai ghosts, yeah, yeah, this story is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Good night. Wouldn't folks. kick it out of bed for eating cookies. No. <laughs> Or bleeding all over from its earlobes. <laughs> well, it, it start yeah, it starts with an amazing set piece. Oh yeah, uh, and based on a real life historical event from 1330. Yeah, the, the Battle of Danamura. Or, yeah, yeah, the, the oh, better known as the tale of the Haiki. I think is that the correct way to say it? Okay. Yep. Yeah, Haiki. Mm -hmm. Long before I saw this movie, um, and growing up as like a little kid, unfamiliar with any form of Japanese culture. The Haike was well known here in the house because me, my brother Miguel, and my dad, we used to watch Cosmos with Carl Sagan. Mm -hmm. And Carl Sagan, when he was discussing evolution, how sometimes circumstance favors different creatures, he brought up the Haike crabs, 
who are real life crabs that because their backs look vaguely like a human's face for the most part they were never eaten by local fishermen thinking that oh yeah the spirits of these killed samurai are in fact inside these crabs so we better throw these crabs out and because of that the weirder crabs eventually became the majority in that uh, region of japan and now you can find haiki crabs with those little faces on the back more commonplace but yeah that story is so famous that even in, in 1980s america when we thought japan was going to secretly take over the world with its armies of ninja <laughs> robots true thing i've heard it i've heard relatives say dumb stuff like that the tale of the haiki is well known enough to actually show up on a pbs science show but mm -hmm. um again like we were mentioning earlier the the whole movie is basically a japanese classical painting brought to life with with some exceptions of course but that sequence with the sea battle is just so extremely well done that literally feels more so than any other example I could think of. I rarely see any movie that takes like an illustration from classic art and bring it to life so vividly and so accurately, if not close to accuracy, than that battle with the, the Heike. Like you mentioned, this was, uh, Patrick, you mentioned this is kind of an independent film. So it's even more impressive that, that they were able to do that without having to get Toho's Big Pool. Or was it filmed at Toho's Big Pool and we don't we didn't realize um. it? I don't believe so. I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they shot any parts of it actually at Toho Studios. I think I think they shot all of it inside that hangar. I, yeah, it was filmed. It was filmed in Kobayashi's own big pool. That's, <laughs> oh, that's where it was. He's got wow, a big he bathtub. Sold his house to finance the film. Yeah, but <laughs> no, it, it is an impressive oceanic set that they create. And mm -hmm. while you know that they couldn't afford putting countless boats, so they didn't do any model shots. Uh, they just come back to the original painting or a version of the original painting, a recreation of the original painting, I should say, showing all the different ships at sea in battle. And yet it doesn't feel like a cop-out or a cheapening. Mm -hmm. It actually works out beautifully. And like I said, the fact that you hear nothing from the battle itself other than just the mm -hmm. music, the poetic uh, narration. I, I hate to use the terminology, but that's definitely the uh, the production special effects money shot of the whole movie. <laughs> but um, it kind of reminds me of uh, in Kagemusha, the aftermath of the battle. We just have like the, the the men and the horses, like you know, just you know, writhing on the ground after they've been shot, and mm -hmm. there's no sound effects. You just have the music. It just takes it just kind of leisurely takes its time to play out. It kind of reminds me of this, that sort of like you know atmospheric effect from kurosawa's film too yeah the, yes. yeah there's that segment in iran uh, where a similar thing happens yes mm -hmm. all-out war and it's just the somber music mm -hmm. sort of acting as the score to this absolute mm -hmm. chaos and the sound design as a whole the like the foley is mm -hmm. extremely minimal in the movie it's very quiet and a lot of the sound design is aided by the great score provided by um now I'm blanking on the composer's name, Pat. Takamitsu Toto, Takamitsu. yeah, and he yes. actually did a lot of the a lot of the sounds in the film too. Uh, again, you know, Kobayashi really wanted to go forward with that whole idea of stylization with this movie, and so he granted uh, Takemitsu a lot of uh, freedom to you know play around with sounds and sound placements. Um, but yeah, it's just all about you know creating more like an effect and atmosphere than you know creating a scary moment. So to speak. yeah, it's not your conventional horror score. There's a lot of bang, 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 to be. Yeah, and just, and just so much great use of silence, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which just makes the whole scene that more absorbing. The sea battle is already great visually, but I think it would have been hampered had it was given. If you yeah. heard everything. Yeah, if you yeah. heard everything, even if it was just muted in the background, or if there was like a more epic score going on, as opposed to that wonderful. Darn it, what is that poetry singing that, uh, that was going on during the sequence? What is the correct terminology for that? Like, the ships are coming! Ding, ding, ding. So, that, that was a terrible impression. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, with the terminology, but uh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, by the way... That, that, was, that was almost as bad as my sound effects there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, and, you, me, and Patrick, we should just do an acapella recreation of the soundtrack for Kai Don. <laughs> okay, so... The first story, we dealt with somebody betraying his good wife to try to marry into high society, and that doesn't mm -hmm. work. Uh, the second story dealt mostly with peasants and their and, and an oddball uh, marriage with a mythical monster. This one, I, I'm glad the focus went to like just like simple priests at a temple 
local normal priests. They're like nothing major, nothing fancy. Yeah, it's a nice temple. Like, you know, I wouldn't mind, you know, getting a sleeping bag and sleeping there. And and you do feel sorry for Hochi himself because he is blind, but unlike most characters with disability from Japanese cinema, especially during this, the 60s, he's not portrayed as like a completely pathetic wreck or like some deformed freak. He's just, you know, a regular guy who's doing his best as he can. And he's mm -hmm. talented enough with his biwa and ability to tell the story of the tale of the Haiki of the Haike battle that you know he, he is a likable enough protagonist that we do care about his safety as the story progresses and yeah course, he's not he's not Zatoichi who's always in command of his uh, destiny yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, I I don't think anybody's Zatoichi so no <laughs> there is no there there's only one Zatoichi yes. yeah grab on his ears you're losing an arm like mm -hmm. this like he splits <laughs> you know we generally do feel not sympathy but ca we care about this character and his safety. And I do love how the movie kind of hints that even though when he's blind and the ghosts seem to be, you know, pleasant towards him at first, you know, we do cut back to the villagers, you know, burying their dead. And, the, oh, yeah, these ghosts, they're a common problem around here and they do kill people after a while. So I understand that there is sort of a there is a threat coming in threat that we do need to protect Hoichi because, yeah, his first meeting with the ghosts went fairly well. When the more he plays the story, you have that great sequence where he's playing the music and then we cut from what looks like a beautiful palace entrance. You know, true, it's supernatural. There's dry ice everywhere. And what looks like a graveyard. Oh, yeah, a graveyard with all these, like, really angry looking pale souls looking everywhere and this is i got i gotta say this movie has like the best pasty makeup effects ever <laughs> like, usually when they put somebody in white makeup you know it's either too bright or it's too you know it's not... flaking and you have a clown effect yeah exactly and here this this is just right it's like oh yeah these these this is ghost skin right here so. yeah like the life is literally sucked out of them and they're a, a blue and white husk yeah and oh the... i'm like me in the winter <laughs> Yeah, but, um, you know, the great thing about Hochi the Earless is that that effect where you become more pale the more extreme you deal with the supernatural, yeah. it, it, it kind of ties the whole anthology together like you can believe it exists in one world. There is that through line, both with the way the visuals are handled and ghost effects are handled, that, yeah, we saw what happens when a ghost attacks you in the first story, so now, with that knowledge in mind, we are honestly afraid for poor Hochi's life. Especially when he comes back from playing for the ghost that last time, and you can see the paleness in his body. And it's like, oh, we gotta save this poor kid. Of course, they foolishly forgot to write stuff on his ears. <laughs> so You're telling me they covered every inch of his body and they mm -hmm. forgot the ears. That's, yeah, these are something, really. That is something that uh, you know uh, Stephen Prince, a uh, uh, great uh, film historian and author. You know, he uh, did a lot of uh, commentaries on Kurosawa films for Criterion and whatnot. He wrote a book about Kobayashi's uh, career, and uh, that's a note that he makes in the part on Kaidan. Is that you know, yeah, in, in her story, it's easier to overlook that sort of logical aspect because it's. A written narrative there's no there's no images yeah but in a in a film where the images are are in front of your face it's a little hard to hide that last because like you know hey we're seeing it ourselves so how come the characters can't see that yeah, yeah now, and, now, and, and i hate to and i hate to sound cold but i mean the boy is blind what's his most important feature <laughs> you'd, you'd think you'd cover that yeah okay now that you mention that patrick it makes a lot more sense because if you're reading it as a book it probably comes out more as a shock yeah. as the ghost was looking around all he could see was his ears it's, yeah. whereas in the movie you're like a, a, a priest, a head priest uh, fellow, and, and hello, hello. like the, the, his ears, like his, hello. <laughs> leads to a great gut-wrenching uh, sequence. So we oh, and it's it. horrifying. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's a cool effect, too. Uh, it is. The translucent body with just the ears exposed. Mm -hmm. that, um, they, yeah, that was really well done. And again, now that now that I have the knowledge that this was more or less an independent production with Toho's slight fingerprints over it, it's even more impressive they were able to do that instead of, like, going to Toho and trying to get Iji to rise help. The... He, was, he was busy, Raph. He was trying to make the butterfly work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. 1964 was a big year for him. So. I, would, I actually would be curious to know uh, more about how some of the effects in this film were done, considering that they uh, were doing it in Kyoto. Granted, you know, Kyoto's had a film history, too, so they, maybe, maybe they uh, borrowed some equipment. I can know Shochiku had a location in Kyoto. Um, maybe they got it from one of those places. Uh, but I'd, I'd be curious to know, like, you know more about how they accomplished some of these effects, considering the fact that uh, they were constantly running short of money and whatnot, and how yeah. they all... Maybe Kobayashi got a real ghost on the set. Who knows? Could be. Oh my god, he was dating an Oni during the productions. What do you guys think, uh, as we close this up, what do you guys think of Hoichi the Earless? How do you feel about this story? Great. 
Yeah, I think it's terrific. And uh, it doesn't end on, again, very a visceral thing of uh, the ghost attacking him and Mm -hmm. ripping his ears off. Mm -hmm. And it does look like it's quickly headed towards, you know, maybe the most gruesome and dour of endings. But uh, it is nice that he does achieve a bit of fame at the end and cont- continues to play. If they got rid of the fourth story and had this movie ended with uh, Hoichi the Earless, it would have been a more triumphant movie. Because mm-hmm. like the narrator himself says, like Hoichi grew up to be a very wealthy man. So granted, he'd still probably be a priest. So, But, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, the church is always wealthy. Never mind. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I don't have a lot to say about the last one. I have a lot to say about the last one because okay. that actually happened to me once long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that. That's why right, that's yeah. be the payoff. Yeah, it was weird. Don't I was cut that part out of the, out yeah, of the I was I was at Burger King having a milkshake, and there was like <laughs> there was like a, a unknown Japanese lord just smiling back at me, and it's like yeah, my milkshake, and he's like no. <laughs> and 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 then an employer at Burger King looked in the milkshake, and it was you doing the. I love the, I love the little Beverly Hillbillies Jed Clampett wave at the end. <laughs> Y'all come back now. You... I'll say that I don't think the fourth story is bad. Right, I, right. I think it's fine if you're going to make the comparison, like to you know, it's my favorite show, and I've been into the mood recently, like a Twilight Zone type of thing. Mm-hmm. If you watch it in segments like that, the fourth story is kind of just a lesser. You know, a lesser kind of anthology episode. It's not bad, Mm -hmm. but the problem is when you watch it as a whole, to me anyway, after the, you know, the first uh, story is a good setup. And then Mm -hmm. the second two are just, you know, phenomenal short films in their own runs. Yeah. 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 Out of the stadium, (laughs) into the air, out of the universe. Great. That I just really wish, man, they could have switched switched the order around, or mm-hmm. with the whole con story, if you would have just cut off there with uh, Hoichi being a success from mm-hmm. his, even even you know deprived of his ears, it would have been a good ending. It would have been a suitable way to end the film, and it would have come under three hours, and everybody would have been happy. Um, yeah, it, it just has it has a hard time following the act of what came before it. Is yeah, the problem. yeah, mm-hmm. to where it's just it's just slow decline. It's not you know what the hell is this, but it's just. <laughs> It doesn't live up to, yeah, what was before. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, I, okay, we, we, me and Brayton have mentioned multiple times how much we love the original Twilight Zone television series. Mm -hmm. And even at its weaker episodes, it was still a fairly entertaining yarn. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, the, I used to be a total season four naysayer, but some of those are actually pretty darn good, you know, get in the, in the context of their own, uh, production history yeah, and we say this even before the horrible remakes and reboots came into existence so, so i i grew up with the 80s one it's like grandma is great f- the episode from the 80s twilight zone grandma is visually fantastic but the child act in a narration in that all oh, kills it basically well but, i i i think a bit even better comparison would be something like twilight zone the movie mm. which uh has that really sort of lame uh remake of kick the can that spielberg directed <laughs> sort of in the middle of or actually no the lesser stories to my recollection yeah the first one was the vic moreau story which yeah. obviously you know, has the horrible backstory yeah. to it yeah but it, uh, it's it's moral and original ending was ruined because of the tragedy yes. behind the scenes yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um and that i think that comes and then i think if i remember correctly the kick the can story is after that and then followed by the uh it's a good life retelling and then a nightmare at 20,000 feet. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of has an opposite problem where it starts with the two iffy ones, but at least it leaves you on a high note. Yeah. Um, this movie, as good as it is, yeah, that is one of the sour notes that, man, it would have been great if it could have maintained that momentum. Yeah. And but with that said, though, rewatching this movie, I have a little more, I have a little more respect or at least tolerance for the fourth story. Because, yeah, it is definitely the weaker of, of the four stories. But at the same time, it's like, unless you completely cut it out, out of the movie totally, it still serves a purpose. For one thing, it, I do appreciate its kind of meta narrative. It's deliberately a story about unfinished stories. Again, when you consider the nature and the historical background behind Kwai Dan the book and its original author, Hearn, there are a lot of stories that are lost to history or stories that remain incompleted. H.P. Lovecraft, uh, he had something called the Commonplace Book, which is basically his notes of various stories and concepts he wanted to do, but they were never fleshed out. And I think it is interesting that they actually do include a story like that into the movie to remind you, first off, 
uh, how much of a triumph it was that Hearn was able to save a lot of these stories for future generations, but also how much of a tragedy that a lot of these stories are either incomplete or semi-lost. So I do appreciate that they do kind of end this narrative movie about ghost stories with a story about ghostly narratives mm. um, or the lost nature of um, ancient media or ancient t- fiction, I should say. It's a, it's a perfectly so, competently told and acted, yeah. you know, the, the main actor is fun and he's laughing. I love his crazed laughter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about his character, the samurai, he's kind of a stubborn cop who've all of a sudden kind of pissed off these otherworldly uh, asshats for like term yeah um and with, and with that says the last film like it's funny because the first story the third story definitely deals with ghosts uh, the second story woman snows is more yokai based Ellen yoko later. ono based yes yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, you had to you had to um but the last story it's never made clear who the supernatural threat are and you almost get the feeling that like a twilight zone story they reminded me less of ghosts and more of that one twilight zone episode where People at a bus stop swear there are like doppelganger style invaders from the mirror trying to take over their lives. Um, so yeah, that story reminded me more of that, especially with like sh- um, the the supposed main villain ship, uh, Lord Sh Chikibu Henye. I, I, I totally bu- butchered that. Lord name. Boom Chiki Boom Boom Chiki Boom. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Lord Hine, the 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 uh, the guy who appears in the cup of water at the beginning. It's like what's smiling his... at him, saying, yeah. "Hey, what's up?" Yeah, is he a ghost or is he just a samurai lord from another dimension or what's going just a on? A trollish specter. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And with that says though, it is interesting that you could leave the story up to interpretation. It's like on one hand, you could see the tale about kind of an everyday, like somewhat stubborn samurai going mad. On the other hand, you could see it as the beginning of like a, a big epic where this guy has to, you know, face against his destiny to fight these weirdos. But yeah, I but do. It, it does have a kind of a comic edge to it, though. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Because he is, he is, he's not the, you know, your Tatsuya Nakadai Toshiro Mofune badass by any means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's he, kind he, of dumpy, kind not. of like a, yeah. kind of like a uh, Japanese, uh, oh, this is going to be a bad comparison, kind of like a real Japanese Mickey Rooney. <laughs> 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 not that bad <laughs> well I'm, I'm just saying yeah, and well, it goes well, back to what i was saying before why if i am going to recommend this film to someone which i absolutely am uh-huh. mm-hmm. i do think the best way to view it uh, you know a newbie who may have a problem with it being three hours long would be to watch it how i watched it this go around which is in segments mm-hmm. uh, like i don't think it's a bad story at all again by itself yeah mm-hmm. on its own like again i appreciate it on a meta narrative level do you think it works as sort of like a an odd little oh yeah this is a, a a little extra encore epilogue it's like it's not as good as the first stories but here's one more just for the road <laughs> yeah I, yeah now I think Bray and I are on the same page in that you know we're like you no know, yeah we don't think it's a bad a bad story at all it just kind of just kind of has a, a hard time following the act of what came before it and you just kind of just kind of want a, a little more punch at the mm-hmm. end of it something with a little more meat to it yeah mm-hmm. so with with that says though. <laughs> I remember many times I introduced this movie to other people, like usually that fourth story always leaves a bad taste in their mouth. And I don't know if that's just a first view. Well, that that can happen with movie endings, though, you know, and I don't think it's the case in here because of how it's structured. But uh, yeah, if a movie has a bad ending, you know, it can be pretty much game over for recommending it to someone. And uh, (laughs) like one of my one of my favorite movie going experiences was seeing uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Uh, which was such a great movie until the end yeah. happened <laughs> until uh, the last 10 minutes yeah yeah and it's and it's unforgivable you know because it is. Mm-hmm. if you're telling a single story that should be you should leave on a high point you know you should mm-hmm. leave the audience with a good taste in their mouth mm-hmm. but okay. um yeah I, I would say i don't i don't want to call the final story in a cup of tea uh, a bad taste in your mouth because you swallowed uh, a spooky <laughs> you swallowed ghost <laughs> <laughs> It was really cold tea. Oh my god! What if that was the original missing ending? It's like like a little samurai pops out of his stomach and then grows to full size. <laughs> so because he drank the water. Anyways, um, I'm sorry, that's a bad <sighs> joke. But yeah, it is it is sort of a sour note to end on. So underwhelming, I think, would be the best way to put it. And also, do you think the fact that it is a story about an uncompleted story kind of rubs a lot of people the wrong way? 
I can only speak for myself. That's not the problem whatsoever. I, I, I kind of, I, I share your, what you're saying. I, I, I kind of like it's a story about stories. Again, I just, I just think that it just needed a little more, a um, little more punch, a little more punch to it to make it a little more memorable, a little more visceral because it's the way you're, you're wrapping up this whole thing. It just feels a little lacking for me. Okay, because yeah, it's like famously every time I showed this this movie to other people, like my late <laughs> friend Mark Tucker, like he's really hard to please with movies, and he was really into Qui Don. But then we get to the last segment, it's like. Like, ah. <laughs> um, maybe I should return this. <laughs> so, but ult- ultimately, though, this is a good movie. We like it. <laughs> we do. It is. Yeah. It's a very melancholy film. At best, it's bittersweet, especially in the case of the uh, third story, Hochi the uh, Earless, and it perfectly captures my thoughts on ghosts. Uh, in general. And it's storytelling, unlike the vast majority of Japanese horror films, which is either too nihilistic, too over the top, or too cruel, without a coherent theme or logic. This film, on the other hand, goes a different route. And as such, the quote-unquote ghosts are treated as actual characters with motivation and purpose. And in turn, arguably, this might be one of the best films dealing with the subject of ghosts I've ever seen, period. So I'm sorry, Brayton, that means Ghostbusters 2 is going to have to go... <laughs> I know how much you love that movie, but no, it's co- quite on this where it's at. So that's a joke. Well, it's, been... it's love wasn't lifting you higher. <laughs> I don't particularly find it scary uh, so much as quietly unnerving. And Be an okay yeah, which is how I, which is how I, on the whole, tend to prefer my horror, you know, for the most part anyway. Mm-hmm. It's more of like a big mood piece than it is anything else. Uh, yeah, this film is certainly more about the atmosphere, and I, that's you know that lingers with you and stays with you. The lavish set design we talked about never undermines that. It's interesting you mention it because again, it's often labeled as a horror anthology. But I it, now think about it, there is horror elements there, but the way it's presented, the way it's executed, it's more of a supernatural fantasy mm, yeah. anthology. Mm, I think yeah. is the best way to describe it. So, and again, like I, I do appreciate that this film in its melancholy. Um, bittersweet attitude the best way I can describe it it ends up becoming more timeless than say a lot of Japanese horror films like we had that brief period in the late 90s and early 2000s where J-horror was a big thing in both Japan and America but a lot of those movies have not aged well like I said they again horrifically over the top and needlessly nihilistic like you know little kids first anime production in, in live action for me, I think this movie perfectly captures my thoughts on ghosts. Yeah, I know ghosts can be occasionally violent and do horrible curses, and I know some movies take that to a more extreme level than others. You know, like, the go- the ghosts compared in Kaidan are, are sweethearts compared to, like, what's happening, Ante and House, or Houseu. <laughs> yeah, Dr- or as I call it, Drats the Cat. But yeah, no, I've always seen ghosts as, like, more sad and tragic beings like living echoes or stubborn shadows than you know outright monsters or supernatural characters but again this movie actually treats all the supernatural creatures ghosts and otherwise as actual characters and as such much more interesting as a supernatural fantasy than just a horror anthology there to scare and spook you. Def- yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Whether you're, you know, into Japanese films or not, you know, it's a, it's a, def- it's a film that's so uniquely interesting that you, I think you kind of owe it to yourself as somebody who likes movies to see this film. And an off the beaten path sort of choice, as opposed to the ones that everybody recommends, you know, your typical Kurosawa or Ozu go-tos. I realize though, sometimes you have to sort of tailor your recommendations to the people. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in, fantasy films broadly I would say it's definitely worth recommending out to someone rewatching the movie I'm surprised how well how easy it is to get into the storytelling even if you have the subtitles problem like granted we live in a weird day and age where television screens are getting bigger and better to look at so subtitles are no longer an issue but thankfully, this is a movie where unless you're dealing with somebody who cannot read subtitles, period, either because they actually have like real physical health issues or they are just, you know, proudly, viciously anti. I think this is a movie that's easy to get into, even if it is just subtitles, although with that. And, sense, and, it's, not, and it's not extremely talky. Which yes, helps. yes. It's exactly. not loquacious by any sense. Yeah, I don't want to call the dialogue or narration simplistic, but it definitely gets the point across. And I think it adds to the movie's timeless, almost universal appeal. It's it's a very accessible movie in the way that it's communicated and told. Mm. Yes. Uh, I, I think, yeah, anyone from any part of the world can get into it. 
Yes, and I'm very happy you guys were able to join me. Brayton, thank you for coming up with this idea in the first place. And Patrick, I, I, feel, I feel confident that the next generation of Japanese cinema writers here in America are, are secured with you around. Thank you, Raph. You're Appreciate welcome. That. Yeah, unless, of course, you go back to your original wife and her hair attacks you, then things are going to get... Yeah, that, that could be a problem, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> Patrick is constantly being attacked by the supernatural. Oh, yeah, well, he knows us, and, you know, you and I are secretly mythical creatures, so I won't say who, that's for another podcast to find out in the future, kids. Okay, so, do you guys have anything you want to plug before we call it quits? Uh, Raph and I do the movie Graveyard Shift every Sunday. This will probably be uploaded later in the month, so I don't know what we're doing closest to when when this is released mm -hmm. but at time of recording tomorrow we're doing uh woman in the dunes which is another great japanese psychological horror of sorts mm -hmm. but uh but yeah, if, if you ever had a fear of getting stuck in a ball pit like at chuck e cheese this is going to send you into <laughs> anaphylactic shock <laughs> uh, so and patrick uh, sure. My book is called Ruan Ling Yu, Her Life and Career. It's available in both uh, Kindle and paperback on Amazon.com. It's about a great uh, Chinese silent film actress who has been Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s, who unfortunately, because of various circumstances, uh, took her own life when she was only 24 years old. Documents um, her life, uh, her career, and documents uh, the story of her industry and also of China in the early 20th century. There's a lot of connecting stories that were going on during her short 24 years on this earth, which mm -hmm. I think makes for a very compelling story, which is why I wanted to tell her story in the first place. Yes. Uh, that's where yeah, you can find it on Amazon.com in both uh, Kindle and paperback. I am honored that I was able to supply artwork for the book, and I deeply appreciate you giving me that opportunity. Poor lady needed fan art so <laughs> but anyways yes let's end this podcast by drinking some nice kool-aid and milkshakes and oh my god who's that oh, in no. there <laughs> and i'm gonna take this pumpkin off my head okay oh my head oh. <laughs> how's that for a scare Okay. That's probably the first podcast to combine quiet end and the bare <laughs> bigger house. In the <laughs> Welcome to an Enshoma podcast. Guy. I forgot that show was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bear in the big blue house. That's yeah. Uh, my wasn't mother that, watched that in the hospital when she was having me. <laughs> wasn't wasn't that Jim Henson? Jim Henson's company who did I that? I think yeah, it was the Henson Company. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're bringing it back. I think it's in the long line of shows that uh, Disney or someone's acquired the rights to. Oh no, not again. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna the sniff you again. Goodbye, 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 Nina. Goodbye, Mamma. Luna, Beatrice, the big blue house. Oh, 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 o